Literally millions will come easier once someone learns how to trade than hundreds did when they were still ignorant. You could literally flip a coin every day, take the trade the coin picked, and manage it using your rules, and you'd make money. What is more important is trying to figure out how to get out and how to protect your capital. And these stocks, some of them had some backbreaking pullbacks. I have another rule that anything corrects 30% off the top, you've got to sell it. There is no one way to, to make money. In my study, most leaders don't top in a climax top. Most leaders top with a failed base breakout. Is it either actionable next week out of a base or is it actionable on a pullback? That's it. And the more things you measure, the better you're going to get. Find what fits you because that, that really is by far the most important determinant of whether you're going to succeed. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Trailline Podcast, brought to you by the Ultimate Trading Guide. I'm your host, Richard Moglin, and joining us today is Ajay Johnny, uh, managing partner over at Single A Capital. Really excited to be chatting with him today. We're going to dive into a lot of different uh, topics, including uh, one of his specialties, which is sell rules and holding stocks for uh, the big move, uh, talking about some different rules that he developed based on his own experience. So, Ajay, uh, thanks so much for joining me today. Really excited to uh, to chat with you. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's great to have you on. Richard, it's, it's great to be here. This has been a long time coming, so I'm excited. Yeah, perfect. And uh, to dive right in, um, I kind of like to set the stage and I'd love to hear kind of uh, your, your origin story, if you will, about how you first got interested in the markets and uh, yeah, kind of, kind of how you've, um, your, your, the trajectory of your kind of trading career. Yeah, absolutely. I, I uh, you know, I, I found trading by accident. It was really a stroke of luck. My, I was doing my undergrad at UCLA. I was a third year pre-med student. And quite honestly, I was a, a pretty mediocre pre-med student. And so I had decided to change majors. I went into economics and literally the first five minutes of the first class, I would, you know, I understood it. I got it. And my GPA went from a low two to a high three over the course of my, you know, the remainder of my school. And right around that same time, this would have been late 86 or early 87, I was sharing an apartment with two brothers. And one guy kept waking up around six o'clock in the morning. And I was not a morning person at that time. And finally, I asked him, you know, he'd turn on the TV, he'd sit there with no sound. And I said, well, you know, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm trading options. And I had no exposure to the stock market. I didn't know what that was. And he explained it to me and I didn't really get it. And then he said, you know, last month I made a few thousand dollars. And I, I stood up and I took notice because at that time, tuition at UCLA was 1400 bucks a year. So $2,000 was the world to me. So I, yeah, I had him explain to me a little bit more. I opened an account. Uh, as you can imagine, it's the classic, you know, the first few trades made a lot of money and then it blew up, but I was hooked. You know, I loved economics and I loved the idea of trying to figure out how this thing called the market worked to try and figure out how to make money out of it. And that's really how I got started. So when I graduated UCLA, I moved to moved to New York and uh, I've been here ever since. I spent five years in London, but other than that, I've been in, uh, in New York and I've been in the financial business ever since. Yeah, and, and you've, you mentioned to me earlier that you've kind of had a few diff different distinct phases over your career, you know, finally settling on, on, on this, fi this current chapter, uh, focusing on growth style, trading, investing. Uh, how did you arrive at that uh, methodology? Because, you know, starting from options, uh, it's definitely a road uh, to get there, learning to manage risk, all of that. So, yeah, I'd love to dive deeper into that. Yeah, the, I, you know, the, my first couple of accounts clearly showed I didn't know how to manage risk because yep. they both zeroed out. Um, you know, my career has kind of gone through three different phases where each phase, even though I was doing different things, each one left with me a piece of what I do right now. So the first phase of my career, I was working for an asset management firm. And what I took from them was the importance of having a process. Mm -hmm. They were dyed in the wool value investors. Clearly what I do is very different. But what I learned from them is to have a process that you can repeat over and over and over. And so you don't get caught up in the story of the security or how you feel. It's you know, what are your metrics to judge a security? And then does that particular security 
meet your metrics. Um, after that, I went to business school. I did my MBA at Columbia, and then I went to go work uh, for a couple of sell site firms. And I started working in the emerging markets group. So I traded things like you know Russian debt and Colombian currency, you name it, everywhere in EM. And I started my EM career in December of 94, right before Mexico devalued. And from 94 to 04, uh, EM, you know, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say emerging markets were in a continual state of crisis, one country after the other for 10 years, and sometimes the same country over and over blowing up. Mm -hmm. And what I took from that period was the importance of risk management, you know, knock on wood during that entire period where I was a market maker at EM, I never blew up a book and I had peers that were down hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in 98. So, you know, so now I've got two pieces of the puzzle. I've got, a, you know, I know I need a process and I know I need risk management. And then the tail end of my career, uh, I worked for a couple of hedge funds and I was doing an EM macro strategy. And what I started to realize is I was making most of my money in equity, but equity was the smallest piece of my capital allocation. And so I realized the importance of concentration and you know focusing your resources where they're best uh, rewarding you. So if you put together that, you know, the three, three legs of the stool, having a process, having risk management, and then focusing on one thing, those are what I do today. And obviously I'm no longer trading EM, I'm focused on growth stocks. And the reason I did that was, you know, back in 88, when Bill wrote his book, I read the book and I really liked it. And it, it kind of got put, put to the side while I took this detour around the world trading all these different countries. And when I decided I wanted to do equity, it was like, you know, the two came together. I've got a process, I've got risk management. I know where I want to focus. And Bill laid out the map in terms of, you know, how do you actually approach investing in equity? And everything you need to succeed is in that book. And that's, you know, kind of where I am today in terms of how I manage money. I don't think, you know, if Bill were sitting in this room and I described what I was doing, he would not, you know, I don't think he'd raise an eyebrow. I think he'd completely understand what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and when did you finally start focusing primarily on growth stocks and, and starting, you know, single A capital and, and all that? This is our 11th year focused exclusively on growth stocks. And, you know, we're kind of classic. I, I haven't traded an ETF in 11 years. I don't do any inverse funds. I don't short, you know, it's just classic growth stock investing the way we all learned it. Yeah. Perfect. And, Outside of Bill's book, um, were there any other key influences on, on your style? Any other books that you find really helpful and complementary to, to Bill's way of doing things? Yeah, absolutely. You know, right around the same time I moved to New York. So I discovered Bill's book. And right around that same time, the first market wizards book came out. Yeah. So, you know, if you think about the Holy Trinity, uh, market wizards, especially the first two books, Bill's book and then Nicholas Darvis book, like, you, you know, those three kind of encapsulate how to, you know, how to have a process, how to manage risk, how to find opportunity uh, and how to profit from it. You know, there are a lot of other books, you know, people talk about uh, reminiscence of a stock operator. That's a great entertainment book. Um, Stanley Kroll has written a couple of books. He passed away, unfortunately, several years ago, but he had a couple of very good books. Uh, I think one of them was called The Professional Commodity Trader. Mm -hmm. And then there's another book that's that's overlooked. It's called uh, it's called The Sophisticated Investor by Burton Crane. And that book came out in the late 50s. And if you read that and you take a couple of days and then you read Bill's book, two different people separated by 30 years in terms of writing their book, and they're talking about the same things which to me, you know, it's just reinforcing that there are generally, you know, there are some good general principles in there that should work over time. Yeah, perfect. And um, were there any specific aha moments that really turned the corner in terms of your performance? Uh, you know, you figured out something, you developed a particular sell rule or buy rule. And I definitely want to get into the rules that you developed later on, but 
Um, was there anything like that where maybe you went through a market cycle and figured out how to fix, you know, something you've been doing? I'd be curious to hear if there's, uh, you know, a couple instances that come to mind of uh, things you switched, you know, rules you adopted that really made a big difference in terms of how you trade. There, there were a few, you know, I would say my, my first aha moment um, during business school, I was trading uh, commodities, PA, and I was doing a fully systematic. Uh, and what I learned through that experience was that, you know, I can do it because it was a successful experience and I wasn't a market wizard. I was just a guy who went to school, got involved in the markets. And I think the realization that you don't have to be born a trader, that you can develop the skills, that was my first aha moment. Yeah. Um, you know, the second really big aha moment happened in 1998. So at that point, I was living in London, I was trading emerging markets. And all the, you know, re reading and rereading market wizards, you know, everybody does something different, but they all talk about risk management. And that year really paid off for me in terms of taking those lessons to heart, uh, not blowing up a book and protecting the capital I was entrusted with. And then I think the, you know, the third aha moment was right around that same time. I just decided, you know, I am going to be successful at this. I don't know how, I don't know where, I don't know when, but never give up. And then, you know, once you have that mentality, then you just study all the time and, you know, you, you talked about some of the, the cell rules that I have, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But I spent, I think it was 2011 and 2012, it was almost a two-year process where Bill has, uh, there's roughly 105 charts at the beginning of the book, and I was able to get data on 100 of those stocks. And I went through each chart one by one, trying to figure out how could I hang on to this? How could I hang on to this? How could I manage this? And that's where I developed the 10 week rules, which we can talk about that have helped me hold on to a few stocks uh, and make a meaningful difference in, you know, in my life. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think there's one moment. I think, you know, if you do this long enough, you'll have an aha moment every year. Some of them are big aha moments, some of them are small, but there's all, you know, you, you never know it all. There's always something to learn. Yeah, for sure. And I also want to ask you um, kind of how you met uh, the life cycle trade authors, because I, I know I know they've incorporated, you know, some of your rules into their book and uh, just be wondering about the backstory about uh, if you guys met at maybe a master trader program or or one of Bill's events. Yeah, those they, they are awesome. I I first met Kurt. Uh, this would have been, I believe, 2010. Um, so at that time, there really wasn't a, an established New York meetup mm -hmm. and, uh, Amy had recommended that I, that I connect with Kurt, who at that time was running the Naperville ID meetup. Mm -hmm. And every year in December, they used to have a level four out in California. And I was out there in that December and I met him then, um, and then through him, I got to meet, you know, the other authors of that book. And, you know, it's been a great relationship. And, you know, a lot of the people that, that I communicate with on a regular basis are based in that Chicago area, you know, people we all know, and they've become really good friends. So, yeah, they're, they're all great. Um, I, I've learned quite a bit from them and I'm excited to, to go through uh, the development of Rerule. But uh, one more thing I know you wanted to chat about was uh, your experience with Van Tharp and, and how that kind of impacted you. So would you mind kind of sharing that story and, and how that's helped your process? Yeah, that 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 meeting and that interaction was another. You know, it was it was a little bit of luck. So I had been working with a guy by the name of Bob Spear who had developed some software that allowed you to do back testing, and it, it was miles ahead of anything available at the time. And he had known Van Tharp, so he connected us, and Van Tharp invited me to come down to his. He used to have an annual seminar in North Carolina. And he was a very interesting character. And unfortunately he's passed away as well. Yeah. Um, he, he, uh, he had asked me to come present some ideas I had on, on uh, portfolio sizing and money management. And at the end of my presentation, you know, we, we were just chatting two of us on the side 
And he looked at me and he goes, you know, signal generation is probably the least important thing in trading. You could flip a coin and if you have good money management, you'll make money. And, you know, as a, as a fairly new person to trading, you know, we're all focused on the indicator or the entry signal, you know, trying to figure out how to get better at that. And I looked at him like, you're nuts. He said, well, you have the software, you can test it. So I said, okay, I will. And I programmed some rules, you know, basically flip of the coin, you know, heads you go long, tails you go short at the open, and then use some rules to manage risk. And I'll be dang, like it worked. You know, the what I did find is that whether it was commodities or stocks, uh, longs tend to do better than shorts. That was an eye opener. Uh, but if you had good risk management, you could literally flip a coin every day, take the trade the coin picked, and manage it using your rules, and you'd make money. Now, obviously, that's not the best way to make money, but that tells you, you know, if you do the reverse, if you if you create, you know, the best entry signal ever, and you use random process to manage risk, you can't make money. Right. And so we we tend to spend a lot of time, including myself, I'm always trying to figure out better ways to get in. And uh, what is more important is trying to figure out how to get out and how to protect your capital, you know, whether you're right and let it run or whether you're wrong and, and cut your loss so you can move on to the next trade. Yeah, perfect. And uh, it might be helpful for people um, to, to lay some context uh, down. So how would you kind of classify your overall trading to give a sense of the time frame time frames that you trade upon? Uh, would you say you're more of a position trader versus swing trader? And kind of how, how long do you look to hold a stock or hold a winner uh, if it's if it's working for you? Yeah, I, I was looking at the stats today. So typically, uh, you know, my losing trades, I'm out pretty quickly within a week or less. And then if the trade is working, it depends on how well it works. So, you know, I looked at, you know, if, if, if I end up closing at a trade and I'm at least 10% up when I close it, on average, those I've held three months. Mm -hmm. If I'm up 50% or more, those I've held an average of seven months. So, you know, we all joke that we would like to hold forever. I've never held a stock forever. I think the longest I've held for a year and a half, and it was something that had a very smooth trend. Uh, but I would say I'm in the, you know, the winning trades are generally months to maybe a year. Uh, and the losing trades generally within a week or two, they're gone. Yeah, no, that I think that's, that's pretty great. And do you have a sense of how many of your trades end up being winners versus losers? Because, you know, everybody's so focused on trying to win all the time. Yeah, uh, they're not so focused on riding the winners and cutting those losers, no matter, no matter how many there are, you know, as, yeah. as possible. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's, you know, another lesson that I've learned is that, um, you know, you can focus on the, the percentage of wins that you have, or you can focus on the magnitude of the wins. Right. And uh, in all of my research and in my experience, if, if you ignore the percent of the time that you win and try and focus on magnitude, you know, for every dollar you risk, how much you make, uh, generally you're going to be much better off. So over time, I'm a, you know, if I just look at a trade, if it's up or down, I'm right about 35% of the time. So fairly low hit rate, but my uh, win loss is four to one in terms of, you know, dollars made versus dollar loss. So, um, you know, I guess the way to look at it is, you know, for every dollar I risk over time, if I keep repeating it, I get a dollar 75 back. And then it's just a matter of how many repetitions you can get of that four to one edge. Yeah, perfect. And are you primarily trading off of daily charts, weekly charts, or, you know, or another time frame, or do you kind of like to incorporate, you know, multiple different time frames into both your decision-making process as well as kind of ultimately your, your buy and sell rules? My, so my, my weekly screening, I do hundred percent on weekly charts. Mm -hmm. you know, I do my work on a Saturday morning and I've got it down to where I can get it done in a couple of hours, run my screens, go through the charts, figure out what's potentially actionable for the week. All that's done off weekly charts. And then once I have my list of up to 10, I, I never have more than 10 on my ready list. 
-hmm. And then on the ready list, then I'll go look at the daily chart to figure out where the pivot is. Is there potential for an early entry? Um, you know, where am I going to set my alert on the chart? But all my screening is done on weekly charts. Yeah, perfect. And um, what what actually, and maybe we, we might want to bring up some charts here to, uh, to help explain this. What what is kind of your ideal setup that you're looking for, uh, you know, to, to put a stock on your ready list as opposed to just, you know, tracking a stock that's that's already trending? Yeah, the, um, you know, if, if you look at the, the 100 charts that I have the data for in Bill's book, about two thirds of them fall into three categories. So one of them is that they've had a multi-year base and toward the end of that multi-year base, they tighten up and take off. Uh, the other one is IPOs that come out right near the end of the bear or somewhere uh, shortly after that. And then the third category is an established leader. So something that's already proven that it's going to run, then it sets up at a higher level base. And so those, I think, are my three, you know, I love to see something that's based for two years and then tightens up and then it's starting to come out. Because if it works, typically, you know, by the time you've you've gone two years, you've either shaken everybody out of the bottom or you've worn everybody out by the time you get to the right side. And so, the, you know, the chart shapes up and then it tightens up. It just tells you that slowly the supply is being eaten up. And then if it goes, it, you know, it's going to launch. And there, the nice thing is we or you know, not the nice, but we've just gone through a cycle where a lot of things set their highs roughly two years ago. Yeah. And so there are a lot of things that have, have you know they've had horrific corrections come back up and now they're tightening and so we may we may start to see some of those patterns emerge and throughout that process that that longer term base um how do the fundamentals come into play are you looking for uh you know maybe a turnaround in their earnings or improvement in earnings sales uh new new products uh how, how do the fundamentals kind of come into play with your process for, for me they're very important i mm -hmm. i almost never buy anything that has down earnings or negative earnings. Uh, if they have negative earnings, I have a rule, they have to have at least 50% sales growth. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we just went through a period where, you know, for eight or 10 years, money was free. Yeah. And so high sales growth was enough, but now money isn't free. And if these companies don't have a, fairly short path to profitability or cash flow positive, you know, the risk is that they run out of runway before they get airborne. So, you know, I'm very cognizant of that. And like Bill, I run very concentrated positions and I run my money exactly the same way I run my clients. Money. I don't have a PA or I should say my PA does exactly the same thing that my clients do. And I'm not going to put 20 or 25% of my account in something that's that's thin, that's not making money. You know, I want the best of the best. Um, the way I think about it, you know, I've got five or six slots in my portfolio, and I want all Michael Jordans, or you know, I want Michael Jordan and Shaq and Michael Cooper and Magic Johnson. You know, I want the best of the best. I don't want the twentieth or twenty fifth and thirty fifth best stock. I want the top five or top ten. I don't always get them right in terms of what I think are the top five or top 10, but it, you know, you have to have that as your ultimate goal to be in the best. Yeah. Perfect. I've got a few questions related to that. Uh, first, um, can you kind of talk through your process for, for building into that position, whether it's all at once or over time on, on multiple buy points? Cause I think that's something that, um, traders often have questions about, you know, uh, if they are going to trade with a, a concentrated position, yeah. um, how to manage risk while establishing that position, if that makes sense, uh, yeah. to make sure that they're they're protecting their downside if that position you know fails the setup and, and ends up not working. Yeah, no, that that is one of the hardest parts of investing in my in my view because the you know it's sort of like once the stock is airborne, then you know the risk is fairly low, it's probably going to keep going, but it's the landing and the takeoff where the danger is. And in our place, you know, 
the, the takeoff is when it's trying to go through the pivot on a base. And we've seen over time, it gets a lot more noisy around there. Right. Uh, but I still follow a classic process. You know, when I establish a position, I take half of, of what a full position is. So if, if I want 20% of NAV in a, in a stock, I'm buying 10%, you know, as my first purchase and then another 6% thereafter and then 4%. So very classic, you know, the way Bill described it, doing a 60, 30, 20. Yeah, perfect. 40, 20 rather. Yeah, and uh, the other question I had is, um, and probably we'll, we'll go through some chart examples. I think this that might help um, uh, answer this as well, but um, how, how do you determine if a stock is a Michael Jordan? How, how do you find the best of the best stocks um, what are kind of the price and volume characteristics that you're looking for? You mentioned the three different categories, which I'm sure plays a part of it, but yeah. um, also what's kind of uh, the qualitative factors, whether that's the story, the theme it's a part of, you know, how does that come into play as well? You know, that is more of an art form than a science. You know, yeah. uh, Bill was obviously an expert at it. Somehow he would always end up in the two that were the best. Uh, what I have found is that over time, I, you know, I looked at my stats in terms of how I've been trading, what I've been trading, and I have uh, realized that over time, higher price stocks are better. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm looking at an $18 stock and an $80 stock, I'll always favor the $80 stock, uh, primarily because of risk management, you know. An eighteen dollars stock, it's so easy to get shaken out of it. You know, six percent. A lot of times that thing will have an eight, six, eight percent daily range. Right. Um, so it's just noise that you're getting knocked out of it. Uh, you know, triple digit earnings and if it's got triple digit earnings and sales and it trades more than a hundred million a day, and it's got a history of triple digit earnings and sales, not a turnaround, uh, generally that's a pretty good sign that there's something special there. And then, you know, you've got to try and understand the story. And, you know, over time, it seems like um, a lot more of the growthy stocks have become tech as opposed to, you know, before there used to be a lot more medical and retail that you could understand what they're doing. And, you know, I'm not an engineer, I'm an economist. So, uh, it takes me a little bit longer to understand some of these stories, but you know, the nice thing now with chat GPT, as long as it's not lying to you, you ask about a company, it'll tell you, you know, enough that you can uh, decide, do I understand it or not? Yeah. 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 Well, even, uh, you know, I, I train as an engineer, but even myself, there's a lot of stocks <laughs> that, that, uh, yeah, you gotta, you gotta use chat GPT or, or dive a little bit deeper. Um, I wanted to follow up on, on, on what you said about Bill, about how he kind of mastered that art of finding the leader. Yeah. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think helped him develop that sense? Was it just studying so many of the greatest stocks, you know, going back in history? Do you think, you know, that could help people, you know, develop that feel for, hey, there's something different about this company that surpasses, you know, the price and volume as well as, you know, the earnings and sales? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, if you look at, the the stocks that he made a lot of money in there were there were a few common characteristics obviously big sales and earnings liquidity was uh it changed over time so earlier in his career he would be involved in stuff that uh you know kind of stick to his hands if he was trying to sell it and so he, he just might hold on to it because he couldn't sell it uh, i think uh his example you know he talks about his example in pick and save mm -hmm. Uh, some of the stories you hear from from the people there, like at, at one point he had such a big position, if he wanted to dump it, he couldn't. Um, but over time, you know, he you know he made big money in Apple, big money in Google. So I think he upgraded his uh, criteria for liquidity primarily because he was ended up you know with a lot big, bigger account. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other common factor, a lot of his stocks were easy to understand, right? You, you know, Costco, you open up a store and there's a line out the door and then you open up another one and there's a line out the door there and they're doing exactly the same thing as the first Costco. And then it's just a matter of how many Costco's can the U.S. support and it, you know, is there a runway? So uh, 
a lot of his stocks, you know, he made a lot of money in Amgen and Amgen had a drug that, uh, you know, helped people who were in chemo with some blood chemistry. And he understood that, like, this helps people get better uh, while they're on chemo. So I think a lot of that was important to him as well. Yeah. And, and just an aside on, on Costco, my girlfriend's trying to convert me. I've just recently become a little bit interested in it, but, uh, and, and the chart setting up a little bit as well. So, um, yeah. And, and the story, it's one of the greatest stocks of all time. And, and for a good reason, just that, that yeah. model completely changed things. Um, I want to ask you, uh, Ajay, about, um, kind of the favorite studies that you've done, um, related to trading. Cause, uh, you, you've done quite a bit, um, analyzing different factors. Um, could you kind of give a brief overview of kind of maybe your favorite ones and, and maybe a little bit about your process for doing that? So traders who are a little bit curious about diving deeper into different topics, maybe have a little bit of a blueprint to follow. Yeah, I, I think personally, my favorite study was the study I did of all the, the leaders in Bill's book and, and using that to develop rules to help me hold stocks. And for me, I, I like that study for two reasons. One is that it was very satisfying to finish. You know, it took me almost two years to go find the data. You know, most of those stocks are not traded anymore. Um, so, you, you know, it takes, it takes a little bit of ingenuity to figure out how to get the data when it, you can't get it on Market Smith or Bloomberg. Um, and then on top of that, um, you know, I joke that I have a spreadsheet graveyard where, you know, I have hundreds and hundreds of spreadsheets where I've done a study. And at the end, the conclusion was this is garbage. Yeah. And this study, I was able to come up with some rules that have helped me. Uh, and I think helped a few other people as well that I talked to, you know, manage their portfolio better and, and manage particular positions better. Yeah. And would you be willing to share some of those key takeaways that the ones you haven't already mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, um, they talk about it in the life cycle book. I think they call it the midterm rule. And I, I call it my 10 week rule. And we can look at some charts as well if you'd like. But basically what I, what I discovered in looking through those charts is that the really big leaders that Bill showed in the book, uh, they rarely violate the 10 week. And if they do, they rarely do it for more than a couple of weeks. <clears throat> so, you know, we think about it, you know, the way Bill described his process, you know, if I were going to simplify it, it's buy a stock at the pivot, sell it at up 20 to 25. And if you get power from pivot, you know, hold it eight weeks and see what happens. Um, and my goal was to try and figure out how to find those stocks that were going to get power from pivot. <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah. And what I... So what I discovered in that study, it was surprising in a couple of uh, fronts. So first of all, out of the 105 stocks, I got data on 100 of them. And half of those stocks didn't have power from pivot, hmm. which to me was very surprising. My, my guess would have been, these are the biggest leaders of all time. For sure, they were up 20% in three weeks and half weren't. So if the biggest leaders of all time, half of them didn't have power from pivot, how are you going to know how to, how to hold them? And when I discovered that most of them, even if they didn't have power from pivot, they would hold the 10 week all the way up. You know, I looked at each one individually and carefully cataloged uh, how many times it was below the 10 week, what were the peak to trough pullbacks? And these stocks, some of them had some backbreaking pullbacks. Yep. It's not surprising for a leader to have a 20% pullback. And it wasn't a 20% pullback like you know, it's forming a base. This thing was a 20% pullback in a week or two weeks. And then, you know, it, it holds the 10 week and then shoots out again. Uh, sometimes 25%, sometimes rarely, but sometimes 30%. And during their run, they would have seven or eight corrections of 10% or more. So if you think about holding a stock and, you know, you've got a full position and maybe you've added along the way and that thing pulls back 20% in a week. That's going to put a pretty big dent in your portfolio. Yeah. Now imagine you're holding five stocks. When that one falls 20% in a couple of weeks, 
the odds are that the other four aren't going up. It's probably because of some pressure, general pressure in the market. And that was an eye opener in the sense that, you know, Bill, if you, if you want to succeed at growth, like that book has everything, there's no secrets. Take most of your gains at 20 to 25, because that gives you the ability to sit with one that's going to, you know, wiggle around a little bit. Yeah, perfect. And um, would you mind, uh, you know, going through a few examples of, of applying this rule? I, I'd love to, you know, show some charts and and uh, I think that helps everybody visualize exactly what you're talking about. So, you know, we won't be able to see the fundamental data because it's a historical chart, but the, the numbers were very good at this time. And this, this the reason I'm showing this, I'm going to show a few charts as, as many as we have time for because these are the ones where I successfully used that 10 week uh, hold rule. And this was the first, the first stop where it all really came together. There was one just prior to this LinkedIn, but mm -hmm. LinkedIn is no longer uh, listed. So I won't be able to pull it up here. <laughs> Pardon me. So this one, you know, when I talked about that multi-year base. So this is almost a perfect example of it. It IPOs and then does nothing for a couple of years and then starts to set up on the right side. And so this is where I started to get really interested in the stock. I think I traded it one time in here for, you know, relatively speaking, a minor gain. But when it set up this base, you know, I got really excited. And, you know, if you read that life cycle book, you know, this is what they would term the institutional due diligence phase. Mm -hmm. So the stock sets up, you know, you can look at it at a cup. I was looking at it as a double, double bottom. Mm -hmm. And when it breaks out, um, you know, this is another example. So if you look at one, two, three weeks out, it's not up 20% from the pivot. So this is another one of those where the, you know, the leader, it, it ended up being a big leader, but it didn't have power from pivot. And in fact, what it did is, is go into another base, but mm -hmm. this whole time here. So this, at this point here, it has one week under the 10 week pops back up. You know, this correction here, it's from 106 down to 87. So it's, you know, in two weeks, that's a pretty sharp correction. It looks like a nice bar at the close, but if you look at it intro week, it's, it's not a great bar, but at this point I had decided on I mean, it. In fact, at this point I hadn't developed the uh you know my discipline to take most of my data so in this period i was every stock i bought i was holding using my 10 week moving average and that that's a whole nother story in itself uh, but you can see how it honors the 10 week all the way up and it never even had two consecutive closes below the 10 week and so the the rule that got me out is if after the breakout uh if it closes below the 10 week and it's been more than a year. So the original breakout happened in May of 2014. And here we are in August of 15. So that first close below the 10 week is your sell rule. So, you know, it's not a sell at the top, but for me, it's a pretty elegant sell considering, you know, the subsequent base was at least 30% deep and 30% would have, you know, I, I have another rule that anything corrects 30% off the top, you've got to sell it. Yeah. And, and looking at this trend, um, that, that one week where it closed well, but, uh, intra week would have looked pretty negative. W what's your mentality like during a week like that, where you've got some profit, but you know, it feels like the whole, you know, the sky is falling, everything's pulling back in your portfolio. If, if you're all trading growth at the same time, yeah. uh, how do you handle a week like that? Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's a relief when everything closes well, but you don't know that's the case uh, yeah. until after the fact. You know, the the reality is that when this thing is trading at 87, mentally I'm thinking to myself, damn, I should have sold this thing at 106. Mm -hmm. But I had a rule and I think, you know, the the importance of having a process and having a rule is you can't overstate it because if you don't have a rule, then every wiggle in the market is going to create an emotion for you that you're going to react to 
And I would say 99 times out of 100, whatever your emotion spurs you to do is going to be wrong. It might be a 100 out of 100, but uh, your emotions are not going to help you. And, uh, you know, what I've learned is that it's impossible to get emotion out of trading. You know, that a lot of people will say, well, you need to trade without emotion. And that's not possible as a human. Right. If you have a computer that's automated, maybe. Uh, but if you are a discretionary trader and you just you can't separate, you know, your livelihood uh, and your lifehood from from what you're seeing in front of the screen. And so the way to short circuit your emotional reactions is to have rules. And then the way you improve is that after you've done a few trades and you realize, okay, there's one thing that I could have done, but I don't have a rule for that. So then you add a rule. Um, you know, I, I, one rule I have for myself is I will never change my rules during the weekday. Mm -hmm. So even if I, if I discover something, if I have an aha moment and I say, based on this rule, I would be doing this right now. I don't do it. I wait till the weekend. And if the rule still makes sense, I write that rule into my rules. And then going forward, I can use it, but I can't use it right then and there. And that, that really has helped me to have a written set of rules that you abide by um, and know what you're, you know, what you're willing to tolerate. So, you know, if you're not willing to tolerate 86, you know, 106 down to 87, then your rule should be when you're up 20%, take it. Yeah. Right. Because if you, if you're not taking it on the way up, this week is going to force you to take it on the way down unless you have a rule. Yeah, perfect. And um, when you were establishing your position in, in, in June of 2014, um, was, was that an earnings gap, that, that big bar as it burst through the double bottom pivot, or is that just kind of normal price action as it worked? Uh, it, and it looks, honestly, it looks pretty similar to a lot of stocks that we're seeing right now after we've had this pretty powerful move up off lows. Uh, so I think it's a good example to go through. Yeah, I, I will be honest. Um, I don't know whether it was an earnings report. Um, I can check on Bloomberg what their cycle is like and then see based on that. So they typically report, they would have reported uh, roughly in May and then August. So unless they changed their, you know, this probably was a, an earnings report because this is May of 2014. Mm -hmm. And did, did you enter kind of after that, you think, or you, you bought through the double odd pivot, had a little bit of a cushion, and then, uh, yeah, we can look back on the daily. That's perfect. Yeah, so here is the, this is the gap up. I'm pretty sure that I was entering my first. At the DTL break. Uh, yeah, right here. So, you know, I had already traded it once off of, you know, I saw this volume here. Mm-hmm. So I got interested and then when it gapped up above the 200 day, I took a small trade in here and it had really good numbers. I do remember that. And so this was definitely on my radar. And so I built, a, you know, the starter position here mm -hmm. and then I filled it out in these days here. And then, you know, back then I used to take much bigger positions relative to now. And so I actually, whoops. I had a uh, full position coming out of this double bottom base. Mm -hmm. And then I increased it by another 50% coming out of this flat base. So if my position was say 20% here coming out of this flat base, I built it from 20 to 30. Mm -hmm. And then I may have added one. I think I, I viewed this as a flat base. So I added even more. So I had, I had a pretty big, amount of my account in this stock um, you know this was one of the one of the stocks that really you know kind of laid the foundation for single a in terms of my ability to continue in business and make a go of it yeah i mean i'm looking at the character of that move it, it loved to compress against that 10 week and then continue higher so that's perfect um you know, thinking back at, at establishing your position and, and, you know, riding it for a trend, uh, you mentioned, you know, at this time, you're kind of considering all stocks kind of in that same vein using that 10 week. Uh, yeah. But but thinking now, 
how do you kind of make the, the call whether a stock is of the quality that you want to try to hold it versus the 10 week versus one that you might take gains a little bit earlier, 20, 20% up, 25% up, whatever it is. So my, um, you know, I had, a, I had a pretty interesting experience in the summer of 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, I had managed to navigate, there was a bear market in late 2018, um, fourth quarter of 18. And it was pretty quick and we got a follow through day, I want to say like the 4th or the 7th of January, it came pretty quick. And I managed to work my way into a lot of what I thought were the leaders. And back then, a lot of the leaders were enterprise software stocks or security stocks. And I had, you know, I had this new toy that I had developed a few years earlier, this 10 week rule. And again, I was going to do the same thing. And I had my portfolio full of these companies. And in the summer of 2019, I want to say August, uh, one by one, they started, you know, knocking me out. And before I knew it, I had round tripped every single stock that I had bought perfectly right in January for little or no gain. And, you know, I, I guess it was one of those, you know, Bill had a very similar experience where, it, you know, the, I think it was the 1962, uh, 1960 uh, bull market and he had bought a lot of stocks. Maybe it was 1959 and he round tripped everything and he went back and decided what he was going to do. And, you know, it took me 20 years of studying his, his methodology or maybe 30 years but I learned the same lesson he did, which is take most of your gains at 20 to 25. And so in the fall of 2019, uh, and I think Lulu may have been one of them. Uh, So let's go back until. Yeah, I think the, the 2019, it had a lot of intermediate corrections around summertime. I think it was like trade tariffs with China, I think was kind of the, It may have been, yeah. So the early part was choppy and then trying to rally and then we got the spare market in the fourth quarter. Yeah. And then I think Lulu was one of the ones that I bought early that year. There were a few others that I bought. And I told myself every single stock that I buy, uh, Lulu was probably a bit later because I was, let's go to January. Yeah, it was probably coming out of, you know, maybe somewhere in here. Mm-hmm. I told myself every single stock, unless it has power from pivot, I'm selling it up 25. And, you know, the thing is on selling it on the way up, we've seen it so many times that you sell and then it keeps going. And Bill cautions us and he says, you know, it's okay. You're either going to sell it on the way up or you're going to sell it on the way down. You're not going to sell it at the top. And having that discipline of taking everything at 20 to 25 by late February of probably even like mid February. So I'm going to go to the NASDAQ here. Let me know if you see that. Yep. So somewhere in here, I'm almost all cash. And the reason I'm almost all cash is because most of my stocks I've held eight weeks. That was one rule I I said I would have, like, even if it doesn't go up 25%, I'm going to try and hold them eight weeks unless they do something wrong, but I'm going to sell them once I've held them eight weeks and they're up 25, they're out. So I found myself almost all cash by this week. And so when this week happened, I had like one position left that I got rid of and it really saved my bacon because, you know, we all know what happened since. And that just reinforced to me the wisdom of taking most of your gains on the way up and you know another way to think about it so imagine you have a portfolio uh and let's say you're just trading one stock for simplicity story so if you put 100 percent of your stock at, you know, of your equity in that one stock and if you say you stop yourself out six percent if you're wrong you're risking six percent of your equity mm-hmm. now imagine you buy that stock at 100 and it goes to 115 or 120 now, if it goes to 120, you're not going to move your stop to 114. That's too tight. It's probably going to be at 105 or 107. So now all of a sudden your risk has gone from 6% of equity to 12 or 13% of equity. 
right? And uh, when you sell a stock at 120 or 125 and you buy a new one at 100, your open risk goes from 14 or 15% of equity back down to six. Right. So if that stock, you know, if the market rolls over and you get knocked out, you don't have this giant open risk. And, you know, if you think about Cansom, Cansom is not about protecting open equity. Like you're not going to trail your stop really close all the way up. It's about harvesting worthwhile gains and keeping a 6% stop if you're wrong until you have worthwhile gains. And how you define worthwhile is different. You know, for me, it's 20 to 25. Some people who have a shorter time frame, you know, maybe it's 10 to 15. Um, you know, having traded all the different things that I've traded throughout my career and all the different strategies I've traded in my career, there is no one way to, to make money. You can be a value investor and make money. You can be fully systematic and make money, but you need to have a consistent process. And part of that process is, is deciding when you're gonna, when you're gonna sell, either to, to cut your loss short or to harvest your gain on the upside. Yeah, perfect. And um, I've never heard somebody explain it just like how you did with the open risk. And that makes so much sense. So I encourage everybody to rewatch uh, that part about, um, you know, when, when you're, when you're trailing a stop, you're, you're willing to give a lot more of a drawdown relative to when you're just far, starting a position. So uh, yeah, that makes, that makes perfect sense about how, the drawdown that you can't experience on the, on those open yeah, and, you know, just to make it a little bit more concrete. So if we go back to the, the, you know, my one of my first bigger winners using the rule, you know, at at this point here, my stop is thirty percent below the peak. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to give a lot of room because my study of the leaders shows that most of them. Most big leaders don't correct more than 30% during their move. If they have a 30% pullback, the odds are that that portion of the move is over. You know, there are a couple of exceptions, but not enough to make it worthwhile. But you need to be willing to sit through a 20 or 25% if you're trying to hold something for, you know, a double or a triple or, you know, something worthwhile. Yeah. Um, are there any other trades that you've applied uh, that rule, um, the rules that you've developed, and uh, it's helped you stay in positions for, for the big run? Yeah, there, there were a few more. Um, Alibaba, I think, you know, we can go a little bit farther out. Um, this is one where I was buying in the handle here, mm -hmm. um, just because it had really tightened up. It was really quiet. It had great numbers. It had, again, a multi-year base, and it was tightening up on the right side. Unbelievable numbers. And, you know, here's one where, you know, it took a long time to make 20%, probably eight weeks. But using this rule, I was able to sit with it throughout this entire period. And so here's this stock, when I did my post analysis, helped me develop another rule. So... The, the base rule is that if you've held it less than a year, you wait for two weeks consecutive under the 10 week, and then you set your stop either the low of those two weeks, or maybe you give it a little bit of a cushion, normally not more than five to 7%. Mm -hmm. And so this passed the test and, you know, made a new high. And then out here, uh, you got two weeks below the 10 week, but then it popped back ab above again. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you go out a little bit longer, you know, one of the rules I have is if a stock ever closes below the 40 week, that's a sell. Leaders don't do that. Um, you know, they may set up and, and work again, but during their big, big move, they don't close below the 40 week. And so that's where I sold my, my position. And I went back and I looked at it and I realized, you know, this had a base here, another base here. Uh, Market Smith shows this as a, an ascending Sending. base, but it's, it's, you know, those pullbacks I think are pretty tame for an ascending base. But on this base here, once it breaks out, 
the rule he decided was that if it breaks out of a new base, then you move your stop to 8% below the pit because that's a base failure. And in my study, most leaders don't stop in a climax top. Most leaders top with a failed base breakout. So they have a third or you know fourth stage base, they break out, they drop 8% below the pivot and it's game over most of the time. So I, I use you know, this experience, um, you know, I would have been selling on that week there, similar in price to where I got out, maybe a little bit better, but more importantly, I would have saved myself two months of uh, use of capital, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's sitting in cash or finding another opportunity. So I think that's another, you know, if you've got something that you've held through a big move and then it sets up another base, if it breaks out and then drops 8% below that pivot, that's, uh, in my book, that's the sell rule. Yeah. And, you know, thinking back of the 2020, 2021 leaders, most of them didn't go into climax runs, uh, you know, net kind of did towards the end there, but a lot of them Roku, they formed that last base wider and looser, yeah. try to yeah. break out and then T doc yeah. as well, tried to break out and then just yeah. reversed. Yeah, there were, there were a couple that, that, uh, that did go through. And that was a third part of my rule that I developed. Uh, LinkedIn had, what I thought in, in hindsight was kind of a climax top. And so the other part of this 10 week rule is, you know, use the 10 week rule if you can. If it closes below the 40 week, you're out. If it drops more than 30% from the high, you're out. And the other thing is sell on a climax top. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at, uh, so let's go to, so Tesla was one that, I don't know if you can see all the chart here, but it had sort of a <clears throat> cup and handle here early, you know, maybe a potential high type flag here. It had another type consolidation here. <clears throat> and this was one where, I mean, so I'm gonna give credit to Eric Kroll. Eric Kroll many years ago developed a checklist for Climax tops, and I took his checklist and I programmed it so that it was uh, quantitative. It would give me the same answer every time. And I have roughly 12 criteria that could signal a climax top. And my rule is if any six trigger on the same day, that's a climax top. Or if you get two consecutive days with five, mm -hmm. that's also a climax top. Mm -hmm. And then believe it or not, this day, Netflix had a, uh, sorry, Tesla had a climax top and I sold most of my position into that uh, strength. And, you know, that, that came from study. If, you know, the, myself five years earlier wouldn't have been selling there. I would have been selling somewhere in here mm -hmm. where it's 30% off the top. So, you know, for all, everyone who's listening, you know, you're never going to, get it a hundred percent up front and you're never going to get it a hundred percent, but you can always incrementally improve. And so the next time you're faced with a situation, you can just do that much better. But there were, there were a couple that had that, you know, where mm -hmm. if you were able to spot the, and this one's probably a little bit later. Uh, yeah, this one on that down day signaled a climax top. Uh, so one of, one of Eric's rules is like a gap in crap where the number of gaps where it reverses and based on the, the total count, this triggered a six there. So, you know, it is more of an art than a science, the exit, but I think there are, uh, you know, if you just read Bill's book, he, he, all the things that I had to learn over and over, he, he taught us that. 30 years ago, if we were paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And I think, I think cell rules is almost the area that people have the most trouble with. Everybody loves to learn the setups. Everybody loves to learn the pivots and the buy points, but uh, the cell rules there, there's almost more emotion going on. A stock's been working well for you. You want to hold on to it, keep it working. 
uh, and you can't bear to sell it. And um, yeah, I think sometimes the sell rules are more difficult to come up with and to, to honor as well. They are, they, you know, on a, on a day like this, where, you know, you've seen a stock come out of a consolidation and it goes from 250 to 450 in a couple of weeks, uh, myself included, I guarantee you sell is not the word that's coming to mind, right? right. Um, it's, and so if you have, uh, if you have rules that you've already decided will trigger a sell, then, you know, maybe this triggers for you, or maybe it's, you know, if it's, if it's been holding the 10 day all the way up this one, whatever rule that you come up with, mm -hmm. uh, if you've decided ahead of time, what is going to cause you to sell a stock, um, that's much more useful than, uh, because if you didn't sell this day, I guarantee you this day is going to be very hard to yeah. sell because you're thinking, you know, uh, I had 450 and now it's at 330, 335. That's a hard sell um, because emotions are kicking in. You're, you know, you know how much you had here. You know how much you had here. If you could, if you just got back to there, you'd be happy, right? Yeah. And so, and when they when they truly climax talk, this this is a classic example because once they climax talk, they collapse. They totally collapse. Yeah. And um, could you could you talk a little bit more about your process for developing these, these cell rules? Uh, so you've got great case studies, which is uh, bills, um, stocks, the model book stocks. How, how do you come up with kind of a hypothesis to test to test? Um, and also, you know, how do you test the validity of it? How do you choose the buy points to use for your cell rules? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because, you know, that's something that um, as you're progressive a tr as a trader and want to develop your edge, develop your rules, that becomes really important. Yeah. The, um, you know, other than studying Bill's book in detail and picking up the wisdom he gave us, the, the best way to improve what you're currently doing is to go back and look at your trades and uh, look at where on the chart you sold, look at where on the chart you think you should have sold and then figure out, is there a rule that you can write that every time you see that situation, it would make sense to sell there? Uh, because you want something that's repeatable. Like you don't want a rule that says on October 14th of 1987, I'm going to cash. That's, right. you know, that's a great rule, but it's useless going forward. So it's not robust. Pardon me? It's not robust. It's, it's, it's not way robust. Too exactly. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you see the stats like, you know, this has happened five times in the last 30 years. And every time this happens, um, that's great. But the next time it happens, if, if the person then writes, you know, it's happened six times in the last 30 years and five times it worked, that didn't help you, right? Um, so you need something that's got a lot of sample size and, you know, there's a hundred charts in Bill's book of quality leaders that you can use to help decide on some ideas for sell rules. And then the next best thing is going through your own charts because not everybody trades like Bill, you know, some people would be, you know, you know, they'd be buying on this consolidation and by this time they're already out, they've made their big quick gain and they're going to cycle their capital over and over. There, there are many ways to, to skin a cap, but you've got to figure out based on your personality, the way you trade, look at the charts of what you've done and then figure out how you could improve. Um, for me, I do a lot of uh, quantitative studies. So for me, data is, is important, the ability to get historical data and then test ideas mm -hmm. uh, and test it in a rigorous manner. You know, the, the computing power out there now allows people to test things in you know a couple of minutes that used to take me 24 hours to test where the computer would literally spin overnight and in the morning i'm just praying to god i didn't have an error in my code that i'd have to redo it over um, the resources that we have now you know we're truly blessed in terms of our ability to 
to study and learn fast relative to to what we had a generation or two ago. Yeah, great. And on on a trade by trade basis, in addition to like looking at the charts themselves and and uh, analyzing your your actions, um, are there are there any key metrics that you find really helpful to track with each of one of these trades, such as you know, um, you know how how fast you know whether it was a power from pivot or um, yeah, I, I can't come up with too many examples, but I, I guess are there anything that you like to keep track of with each of your your trades so that looking back, you can start to rec- recognize different signals of, hey, most of my losses occur in this situation when this metric, you know, was below this or something like that. I, sorry, this might be a, a bad question, but. No, it's actually a very good question because, yeah. the, you know, if you, if you think about what we're trying to do, we're trying to buy the right stock at the right time and in the right amount. Right. And the, in many ways, the right time is the most important aspect of what we do. And even Bill says it, you know, the M is the most important uh, letter in canceling. So, you know, one of the things I did many years ago, I did a study of uh, my buys, the date that I was buying. And then I looked at the indices on those dates. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, you know, that takes a long time because you've got, you know, hundreds of, of trades and you've got to plot where the indices were. And I made it, uh, for me, it, that was another aha moment where I discovered, you know, I basically created for myself a buy window where if certain things were not in alignment, uh, I learned that I was doing uh, the majority of my trades uh, were not making money. Uh, so I, I learned that basically when my buy window was open, something like 90% of my profit was made on trades that I did when my buy window was open or the, mm-hmm. you know, the buy window that I developed. And uh, those 90% of the P&L was only coming from 70% of my trades. So in other words, I could, I could have cut off almost one third of my trades and still made 90% of the money I made. And having that buy window has, has helped me tremendously because when my buy window is closed, I know I just need to sit on my hands. You know, we all get, uh, you know, during bad markets, there are periods where, you know, for three or four days, the market looks really good and we start to feel FOMO. But if you have a buy window that you've decided, you know, I will only trade when this exists. And for Bill, that was a follow through day. Um, that's very useful. So for my buy window, it's very simple. If I pull up the index indices, I'll pull up NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. So we'll look at it today. And it's a very simple criteria. Uh, Is the NASDAQ above its 50 day? Is it above its 21 day? And then are growth stocks above their 21 day? Um, For myself, I develop a list of what I think are the 10 elite leaders in the market. And I plot an average of those 10 stocks and see if they're above the 21 day. But for people who don't want to do that, the IBD 50 has an ETF and you can Mm -hmm. look at that, Mm -hmm. see if it's above the 21 day. So if you just traded when growth stocks are in gear and the NASDAQ's in gear and go back and look at your, all your trades and, you know, just tick off, put a one or a zero next to it based on, whether the buy window is open or closed, I suspect that most people will find that their profitability would improve tremendously just by stopping trading when, when the opportunity set is limited. Yeah. And how, how long does your buy window extend past when, when those conditions are met? How long early on in that market cycle uh, do you look to, to accumulate positions? So it, it, it depends um, in, a, in a true bear market. So for me, any correction more than 15% on the index, mm-hmm. if my buy window opens, I'm willing to leave the window open for 13 weeks, assuming the window stays open, mm-hmm. right? So there were many times in here where the buy window opened, but then it shut again. And so if it shuts, then it shut. But if it stays open, 
I'm willing to establish positions up to 13 weeks after the window opens. Mm -hmm. But in a correction like this, which is much shallower, I think uh, NASDAQ may have been 12 or 15, you know, 12 or 13 percent. Yeah. So that yeah. buy window is only four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, because I think in a, in a <clears throat> you know, if, and I, I hate using these terms because one never knows till after the fact, but if we're in a bull market, um and this is sort of the first pause that refreshes then uh, we ought to be willing to you know the leadership should already be out mm -hmm. and so given that the buy window is open somewhere in here it shouldn't take more than three or four weeks for the the best names to make themselves known um, and if it does, then there, the odds are that we're going to have to have another pullback where new names set up and then they'll break out and you'll have a window of, of four weeks, assuming the window stays open. So, you know, for me, my window opens somewhere. Um, you know, I still do use the follow through day as an opportunity to buy. So even though technically the buy window is closed, I did buy <clears throat> two half positions here, mm -hmm. but then the remaining positions I was buying, I waited till after the windows opened. And tomorrow is two weeks after the window opened roughly. So I think, you know, in the next two or three weeks, you've got to be able to identify what's leading and find a way to get in. And if you missed it, then at that point, you've got to be, uh, focused on waiting for a pullback into a moving average or maybe a three weeks tight, a secondary buy point because the, the leaders are gone or will be gone in the next few weeks if, if the rally holds. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Um, what have been some of the kind of the top names that you've been focused on? Uh, it'd be good to kind of go through those charts and, and, um, and uh, take a look at them. They, there's been a lot of powerful moves over the past a week or two here uh, during, yeah, they, during the there moment. have been yeah. um, so there you know there there are a variety of names at various stages in their cycle so I think a lot of people have been looking at Nvidia for very obvious reasons it's got triple digit earnings and sales mm -hmm. uh, this year they're going to have triple digit earnings next year they're going to have you know expected sixty percent earnings which for a a uh, trillion dollar plus market cap that's really moving the needle yeah um and it has a, a formation where you had a multi-year uh setup and then it's tightened up you know we've got a 22 percent base which is for a nasdaq that corrected 13 it's not too bad it's not not the best but not too bad it's an identifiable base uh probably the biggest uh the biggest downside for this stock is we never really got breakout volume. The best it did was 22% on this first day. And on that day, it kind of squatted and, and fell below the pivot. But, you know, it's now got two days in a row where it's up 12 out of 15. So there is some steady accumulation in the name, but it's not thundering. Uh, if you want to look at something that's thundering, we just had an earnings report last week in Duolingo. Uh, you know, up 20% on 5X volume. Uh, you know, as Bill liked to say, that's not your Aunt Martha volume. And yep. even and I, uh, Eve Bobak, who I think you've spoken to as well, we've looked at a lot of gaps and we've, uh, there are a lot of gaps that are sort of common gaps or gaps within bases, but something like this maybe, but definitely this one looks like a breakaway gap where it's just, you know, it's in a base and all of a sudden it just explodes on volume that is tremendous. Um, and this has numbers now. It's got now two quarters of triple digit earnings and, and pretty consecutive, you know, pretty steady, uh, Sales growth. Sales yeah. growth in the 40 or 50 percent. So that's nothing to sneeze at. And um, for for a name like this, sorry, sorry to jump in. Um 
do you do you position on the earnings gap itself or do you wait for some type of mini consolidation mini flag uh to manage your risk against uh, for me, that's more of an art than a science. It really depends because we've seen a lot of gaps have become a lot more common. And so they've become a lot more erratic, in, in my opinion. And, you know, one example of that is this company here. Uh, yeah. It's a smaller company. It's probably now in the borderline of liquidity. But this had a huge gap up at the open. You can't see the open on this chart, but it gapped up at the open and then basically went straight down. And this, this is the type of trade where uh, if you, you know, if you buy the, let's see if we can see it on the, yeah. So like if you buy this stock at the open and then if your next move is to put in your stop loss, you're probably going to get the electronic message says this trade is likely to immediately trigger. Right. You were already stopped out before you got the order in. And then it's just a matter of where in this mess you're out. So um, I tend to be a lot more uh, careful about these gaps now because so many we've seen do exactly what, you know, instead of what Duolingo did, they do what, uh, App loving did so, you know. Part of it is App. App was a little bit smaller stock. Like I think it, before the gap, it wouldn't have even passed my liquidity metrics. Uh, and quite frankly, before the earnings report, it didn't even have the numbers. Yeah. Um. I'm 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 kind of a stickler for numbers. I'm also a stickler for liquidity. It's very rare that I buy anything that has less than a hundred million a day in turnover. Uh, and I think right now. I don't have anything that trades less than two or three hundred million. So they're, you know, they're bigger companies. They're going to trade a little bit more orderly. Uh, and one, you know, one thing I learned is if if you have a portfolio full of rocket ships, the, the rockets go both ways, and they all go at the same time. And so if you've got a portfolio of rocket ships and you're fully invested, you're going to have a day that you're down ten or twelve percent for sure. Because they're all going to be down, they're all going to be down this, uh, you know, big, and typically, not always, but typically, the rocket ships are smaller stocks, which tend to, you know, they they uh, the volatility is exacerbated both ways. Yeah, and and coming back to to the gap ups, are there any characteristics that you've noticed that tend to lead to a successful trend after a gap versus one that might. Uh, fizzle out, you know, retrace that move and and not really lead to anything substantial. I, you know, even I have studied it a lot. And I think probably the main conclusion that we've drawn is that when you're looking for breakaway gaps, gap one is the best. Gap number two is okay. And after that, uh, you're playing with fire. Yeah. Because if you think about what gaps are, you know, when a stock gaps up, so on this day, the stock is up 22% on four, uh, almost 5x volume, 384, so 4.8 times volume. Stocks only do that when people who have been looking at this stock have, have mismodeled it, right? They thought it was going to be a certain trajectory of earnings and sales, and this company announces their numbers and they're so far beyond what anybody imagined that everybody's going back and redoing their their model and that typically works you know once or twice uh it's very rare you know when even i looked at this it's very rare for a company to be a serial gap or where you have four or five six gaps in a row. normally it's one or two and so you want to get in early. Um, and this was, you know, in hindsight. So if you go back to March, you know, this doesn't look ideal at the time. We've got a lot of overhead, mm -hmm. but it ended up working. But I think what even I found is that historically the ones where you clear something, which at this point, this overhead, 
reader is, you know, it's old enough that you can ignore it. Right. This is more the signature that we're looking for, that it clears everything on the left side on massive volume. And it's, we're typically looking for at least 10% on the day, if not more, you know, what we term a super breakaway gap, it's gotta be at least 10% on gigantic volume. And I, I believe this one also had a pretty significant like earnings beat as well. I, I was wondering if that's something that you've taken a look at and, uh, oh, actually it didn't have an earnings surprise. Interesting. I think the, the, what, uh, I don't know the story hands down, but from what I understand, the, the guidance was pretty attractive mm -hmm. and more importantly, they, you know, if you read this, um, it doesn't sound that exciting, but what they have done is started to transform themselves from an online language platform into an online learning platform. So now they have music lessons, math lessons. Mm -hmm. And so now you can see how a fairly narrow market all of a sudden could become quite a big market, right? Um, and I think that is what got everybody excited. Yeah, that's a little bit of N factor playing into it. Exactly. This this now to me has, I would have struggled to identify the N before, uh, you know, reading the transcript of, of the call and learning what they're doing. Yeah, perfect. Um, what One of my favorite questions to ask is about uh, routines, just because uh, they're they're not the sexy part of training, but they're they're the part that actually leads to consistency and and allows you you know to stay on top of everything. Uh, w would you mind kind of running through kind of what you do on a weekly or daily basis to uh, analyze the market, how stocks did, and and find ideas through uh, maybe different different screens that you run? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that the routine is very important. Um, you know, my, my wife nicknamed me Big Ben because I'm just like, I'm a man of routine. Like the same time every day, I'm doing the same thing. And for me, the big work happens on the weekend. Yeah. And I think that that's important for two reasons. One is that I put a lot of value on the Friday close and how the Friday close looks. You know, people who are willing to hold stock over a weekend have more conviction than people who are holding it on a Monday night or a Tuesday night. Um, so I want to see what the weekly bar looks like on a Friday close. And also, I want to be able to do my work when the numbers aren't flashing on the screen, right? Nothing is trading. I couldn't do anything on a Saturday morning, even if I wanted to, to my portfolio. And so I have a handful of screens, maybe a dozen different screens, that I use to find different characteristics that I have found and others have found are predictive of potential big movement, right? They're no guarantee, but they're, they, you know, they're kind of the breadcrumbs that lead you in the direction of potential. So I run all of the screens and I dump all the names into one list. And then from that list, I go through and further screen so that the, the you know i i want everything so i want liquidity i want big sales and earnings uh roe is nice to have it's not a need to have uh but profitability pretty much is a is a need to have liquidity is a need to have mm -hmm. and i end up with a list depending on the health of the market somewhere between 100 and 150 names so that's my universe and then I will go through each chart one by one and very quickly decide, is there anything this stock could do next week that would make me want to buy it? Right. And so for the most part, that's a judgment of, is it in a recognizable pattern that I'm comfortable buying? Or is it a leader I've missed that could pull back to the 10 -week? So here's an example, Duolingo, I don't have a position. If this were Friday's close, I would look at this and I would just pass mm -hmm. because there's nothing this stock could do next week that would get me excited. Right now it's sitting 30% above the 10 week. If it got back to the 10 week next week, I Something's don't want wrong. it. Yeah. It's wrong, right? Yep. So 
I need time for the 10 week to catch up on this and maybe I'll get it somewhere in here down the road. Mm -hmm. So part of the judgment is if it's already gone, will it do something next week that is normal that gives me, uh, gets it into a position where I want to buy? And that's what I'm looking for. All the charts I go through, is it either actionable next week out of a base or is it actionable on a pullback? That's it. And, you know, one by one, I go through those charts and if they're extended or they're not in position uh, or they're way low in the base, it's just delete, delete, delete. <clears throat> and then depending on the health of the market, I'll have five to 15 names. And if I've got more than 10, then my job is to, to winnow it down because I don't want more than 10 names on my, on my ready list. So let's say I've got down to, <coughs> pardon me, I've got down to 10 names. And after that, I'm just figuring out what, at what price is it going to be actionable next week? And I set up my alerts in Bloomberg so that I get a, a pop-up in an email that says, you know, this stock's at your level, it's time to act. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my weekend routine. Um, you know, it's kind of the nitty gritty. I take a snapshot of my portfolio every Friday so that, you know, five years from now, if I wanted to see what my portfolio looked like, this Friday, I can go back and take a look at it. I keep track of my daily equity. Those are kind of, you know, little details. Everybody's going to want to track things differently. What I would say is that in this game, the more data you keep, uh, the more valuable it's going to be down the road because there's always going to be something that you decide you want to study. And if you didn't save the data, you kind of SOL, right? So uh, it's better to save it ahead of time how much you were invested, you know, print out the charts, you know, what the sales and earnings are like, because, you know, we looked at the, the Palo Alto chart and right now you've got to take my word that they had good numbers, but they did have good numbers. Um, and I could, you know, you could print out the chart and have a, have a look at it. Uh, but the, you know, the more data you save uh, and the more things you measure, the better you're going to get, because then you're going to, you know, if you keep track of your drawdowns and you see, repeatedly that you're having 30, 35% drawdowns and you don't want those 20 or 25 or 30% drawdowns, then you've got to come up with a rule to help you manage your portfolio. But if you don't know how deep your drawdowns are, you're never going to even think to, you know, see what could I do to improve because you haven't been tracking it. Yeah, perfect. Um, and one question, and I think an issue that a lot of traders run into is, narrowing down that ready list to you know a select few names so they can execute well um do you have any advice or, or mental processes that you go through to say you have 15 or 18 names on that how do you make that final decision to say all right these are the ones that are the best of the breed these are the ones i really want to focus on next week there you know for me there's a few different criteria if i've got more than 10 names then you know you're, since I'm looking for everything, I also want to see sponsorship. I want to see top quality funds, whether they're mutual funds that are listed in, in MarketSmith or hedge funds, which I can see on Bloomberg. You know, I want to see other people who are smarter than me have decided that they want in this stock. So if I've got more than 10, then the ones that don't have that sponsorship, they're easier to draw. The ones that have lower liquidity you know, I mentioned typically I don't do anything below 100 million. So if I've got, let's say I've got 11 names on a list and all the other ones are trading three or 400 million and one of them's trading 110 million, most likely, unless it's a new new company that had an IPO, it's got triple digit earnings and sale, most likely that's the one that's going to go because the, you know, the, the gift that we have you know, relative to a normal business, you know, if you're in a normal business, you're Macy's, you're buying dresses or you're buying hardware or whatever, you know, if you decide you need to sell it, the, the first cut is off 50%, right? Yeah. And for us, you know, we just, if we buy a stock and we immediately change our mind, the first cut is like, you know, 10 cents or a percent. So liquidity is kind of the lifeblood of what we do. The, the less liquidity that we have, the the higher the odds that if 
uh, if something goes wrong, it's really going to hurt. Yeah. Um, I had one of those stocks earlier in my career. Thank God I only had a quarter position. I had a, I had a position in a stock, had triple digit earnings and sales. It was a little bit lower priced. You know, it was probably a teenager, maybe $18, $19. And uh, my wife and I were traveling that morning. So we're at, at JFK standing in line to check in. And my company, I'm on my uh, phone, and this is before iPhone. So I'm on my BlackBerry trying to log into my uh, account to see what's going on. And the company surprised. They announced earnings early. And the stock was down 50% pre-market. Oh. And you know, my first instinct, thank God, you know, having you know, drilled the, the lessons of the market wizards, you know, manage your risk. My first instinct was to sell. So I'm sitting here in JFK trying to get my login to work so that I can sell. And I sold it. And uh, thank God, because that thing eventually went to zero. But uh, that was a less liquid stock. I think at the time it was probably trading 20 or 25 million a day. It's very rare for a stock that trades three, four, five hundred million to gap down 50%. Yeah. 10%, absolutely. But if you know, in the in the types of stock we trade, uh, a five or ten percent gap down is not going to be unheard of. It's going to happen to us sometime in our career. Yeah. Uh, and then the question is, have you sized it right that you can survive? Uh, and are you willing to act when you see what's happened? You know. The worst thing that can happen is you have a stock that's 20% of your portfolio gaps down 15% through your stock, uh, or you know if you use a mental stock through where you were supposed to sell it, and you then you start to play with fire and say I'm gonna I'm gonna wait to see how it trades. Um, that is that is error number one by far. Your your best move is just cut and and you know revisit. Yeah. And the first loss is always the best. Yeah, for sure. And um, one, of, one of the things you wanted to talk about a little bit um, was the mental game aspect, which which is certainly dealing with, with gap downs as part of that. Uh, and I know uh, you mentioned you've been working with Jared Tendler to kind of improve on that aspect. Um, do you have any kind of general advice for people who want to improve their training psychology and maybe some exercises that you do uh, to, to, you know, sharpen that aspect of, of their game? Yeah, I, I uh, you know, as I get older and older, I realize that that's probably the number one determinant of, of sure. success in the market. Um, if, if, if your head is not right, no matter what you do, you're going to find a way to mess it up. And so I think, you know, for me, there are... Uh, there are a few things that I think are important. One is your health. Um, you know, during my career, when I was working for other people, I kind of let my health slide. And when I left to do single A, one of the first things I did is put myself on uh, a diet and exercise regimen. And I lost, it took me about a year and a half, but I lost 30 pounds. And it's made a world of difference. I do uh, two hours of outdoor walks every day. Uh, I go walk in Central Park. So, you know, just being out in nature, you know, you can argue whether Central Park is nature, but for me, it's the closest I can get. Um, and then the other thing is how, you know, I meditate every day. I started that last year. I do about a 20 minute meditation, uh, a guided meditation that a friend did for me. So I do that every day. And then, as you mentioned, I've been working with Jared for about two years now. I, I read his book uh, in the fall of 21. And I have to admit, I read it and I didn't really understand it. Like, you know, 90% of it went over my head. So I reached out to him and, you know, we started working together. I speak to him once a month. We started doing it once every two weeks and then uh, I've moved it to once a month. And it's definitely helped me. Uh, recognize patterns in myself because you know he's almost a mirror like you'll talk and then you know, the, the reaction you get you kind of know okay there was you know that reaction is not like the normal reaction there's something there so 
you know, either he will uh, dig into it or you ask him. Uh, and it's helped me, it's helped me become more calm with my rules. You know, my rule set is much more detailed now mm -hmm. because I know that I need to have the rules in place to act. And if you have a good rule set that you trust and that you have tested, then what we do is easy. It may not be easy every day because, you know, we're not going to be at new equity highs every day, but it's easy in the sense that, you know, our job is basically to stand at the plate and swing when we see the right pitch. And the, the worst thing that can happen is if you go through a period where if you don't have a set of rules and you're just swinging, by the time the, the fat pitch comes, you hesitate. And if you hesitate and you miss that pitch, then it's going to just spiral out of control because then you're like, it's almost like revenge trading at that point. Like, I'm, you know, the next one, I'm going to really crush it. Uh, but the next one might not be a fat pitch. And so I think getting yourself in a place where you're comfortable continuing to swing when you're in a slump, not necessarily in the same size. And, you know, the, the buy window is a way for me to protect myself if I'm in yeah. a slump. Because most of the times I'm in a slump when, when I'm trading and the buy window is closed. And so now I just don't do that. Um, you know, one of my fears when we started, we started working in October of 2021. And I told him that first session, my biggest fear is that uh, we're going to get in a bad market not that I knew we were, but my fear was if we got in a bad market, that I would suffer death by a thousand cuts. You know, buy a stock, you're down six. You buy a stock, you're down six. And so in talking through that with him, he helped me think about rules uh, or he helped me to get the motivation for myself to think about rules that would help me. Uh, and that, you know, in... Coincidentally, in 2022, the ability to avoid death by a thousand cuts was very important. Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, getting a buy set up is important. Having a rule to sell is important. Having a, a rule on how many stocks you're going to have is important. But the most important thing is to have a set of rules that you believe in. If you don't believe it, no matter what you write down, it's not going to work. And it, as I said at the beginning, there are a thousand ways to make money in the market. You just need to find one, you know, and I've tried it all. I, I tried value investing. I tried spread investing. I tried commodities. I tried long short. I tried options. Uh, I think the only asset class I haven't traded is crypto. Uh, I've, I've traded Russian bonds. I've traded Indonesian currency, South African, you name it. And I have through all those experiences, come to find what I enjoy doing, what I'm able to do, and what suits my personality. And if, if you can combine all those three, you're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's just a matter of getting successful and then improving on your on your success. You know, to get better based on what you what you learn from your your past behavior. Yeah. And is part of that process of getting better, simplifying things and, and trying to refine and, and uh, you know, make a system that's more robust by, you know, eliminating parameters and focusing on really the, the heart of it that really works. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I think, you know, it's easy to optimize. And I, I have found in my career that optimization uh, doesn't work. You need, you need broad principles uh, on how markets work. Uh, so, you know, if you think about Bill's book, Bill's book, he really could have written it in two pages, you know, buy high quality stocks coming out of a base, sell them when they're up 20 to 25% and stop yourself out down 6%. If those were the only three things you took from his book and you could do it over and over and over, you'd be a winner. And then if you add the filter of when the market is healthy, that will be a, a big boost. You know, you don't need a lot of rules to, 
to be successful. And then it's just details. Like, you know, before I was selling stock, <coughs> pardon me, after it's down 30%, when if I had a rule that if it's a climax top, I'm allowed to sell. That's a detail. But, um, you know, it's a minor detail that helps. But if I didn't have it, I would still be successful doing what I was. But, you know, part of what we do, it's always nice to, to there's no destination, right? We're never going to be 100, but wherever you are, if you can go from 50 to 52 or 52 to 55 or 80 to 90, if you can get better, there's, there's, a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of joy in that. Um, and that's what makes this so uh, infuriating and yet so fun at the same time. Yeah. And, and small, small improvements, even if they seem small can make a big difference at the end of the day. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when it comes to training psychology, um, are, are there any uh, exercises or uh, things that you've worked through with Jared that, that have really made a difference in, in helping you find out something about uh, your process or how to protect your confidence any kind of exercise that you would recommend that, that people do on their own to do some reflecting and, and improve that side of things. Yeah. The, pardon me. So that's a good question that, you know, we've spent a lot of time. Uh, he's a big believer that intuition when it's, you know, when it's true intuition, it's valuable. And for me, the challenge is, uh, what feels like intuition is probably just an emotion mm -hmm. and they're very different, right? Emotion is just a gut reaction that you're uh, having in response to a price on the chart. Whereas, and he's, he'll be able to explain it to you much better than I will. But, you know, when I used to have a feeling that I need to do something, you know, he would walk me through it. And for me, I would get this, tightening up in my stomach. And that was an emotion, not intuition. He said that for you, most likely, if you're having an intuition about, you know, you're, you've seen this movie before and you know how it ends. If that's your, you know, that's intuition, you're not going to get the pit in the stomach because you're not going to feel uncomfortable about it. So you know, I've been working a lot to, you know, whenever I have an urge to do something, you know, I try and remember to notice whether I'm getting that pit in my stomach. And I think, you know, some people will have a different feeling for emotion, but for me, it tends to manifest itself in terms of, you know, my stomach just tightening up. Um, so I'm trying to pay more attention to that. And you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I tend, even though I didn't train as an engineer, I tend to lean in that direction, like, you know, science and math and you know, quantifying something and systematizing something. So this is a whole new frontier for me in terms of, yeah. of trying to explore intuition. But I think, uh, you know, if I can get better at it, I think it will, you know, wherever I am in my training journey, I think it will help me move in the right direction. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I just have a few other rapid questions. Uh, first, um, I'd love to hear if you have any kind of favorite quotes, quotes related to trading, whether, you know, William O'Neill said it or just there's a quote that you relate to trading in some way that helps you kind of uh, frame frame something. So do you have any kind of frame favorite quotes that come to mind that uh, you think would be valuable to anybody watching this? I, I think that the, the general principle of, you know, cut your losses short and let your profits run. And many people have said it in different ways, but the principle is sound. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you buy a stock and you always sell it, if you're down 6%, you're not going to go out of business. Uh, and then it just depends on your position sizing in terms of the drawdown you're going to take, but you're not going to go out of business. And, you know, our raw material is capital. If we don't have capital in our account, we're not going to be able to trade. And when I first started trading while I was in college, I blew up two options accounts. So I learned very early, <laughs> I don't want to blow up anymore. Uh, you know, there's a quote in Jesse Livermore's book, uh, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. And, and 
you know, I have mixed feelings about that book because there's so much wisdom in there, but, uh, you know, the way he handled his career and the way it ended up, I'm not necessarily, I, I wouldn't agree that he's one of the best traders of all time, but he had a lot of great wisdom. And there's a line in there that says, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but it's something like, literally millions will come easier once someone learns how to trade than hundreds did when they were still ignorant. And I think there is amazing wisdom in that quote. Once, once you take principles that have been shown to work over hundreds of years and you apply them to your trading, you'll be flabbergasted how quickly you improve in terms of your ability to become profitable and to accelerate that profitability. And so, you know, this is a game that has been played over and over and over. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. The wheel's been invented. Just figure out which wheel works for you and run with it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And uh, my last question, do you have any kind of uh, general advice and you've already shared a, a, quite a bit, but any kind of advice for traders watching this uh, maybe they're on kind of the earlier part of their career where they're developing their system. They're just kind of learning about Bill's process and, and the basics of can slim. Any advice for them to kind of accelerate their path if they can um, and and help them kind of get those aha moments that can progress them along their journey? Yeah, I, I would say so. I would step back once and instead of advice for people who are trying to be growth stock traders, if they're very early in their career, the first thing I would recommend is try everything mm -hmm. because you don't really know what's going to suit you until you're actually risking capital on a strategy. And so, you know, let's say if you've got 10,000 to start with, take 9,500 of it, put it in a savings account, put 500 in an account and try a strategy and see if it feels right to you. And then, you know, try long, short, try options, try commodities, try everything so that early in your career, you know, if there are 101 ways to make money, you eliminate 100. And then once you find that one, go in extremely deep focus, figure out how to become good at it. And only once you've shown an ability to succeed with that process, then start adding money to your account. Like when you blow up your account, you want to blow up the $500 multiple times yeah. because that gives you a lot of times to fail and learn before you're putting real capital at, at risk. So I, I would, I personally really believe in what we do, but I've done so many other things uh, that gives me uh, knowledge that, you know, I tried that and that didn't work. It didn't work for me. I tried that, that didn't work for me. I tried this and it really works for me. So I, I would recommend people who are young or people who are just starting on their journey to, to experiment and experiment small. You're, you know, if, if your goal is to trade full time and you're just starting out, the odds are that you're not going to achieve that goal tomorrow. It's a, it's a journey and sometimes it's a longer journey. The, you know, 2020 and 2021 were unusual for our style of investment. And so I think people might have um, skewed expectations a little bit. Yeah, their expectations may be a little bit too high in terms of, of what to expect on it on a on a on an annual basis. So you know take time to learn and uh, and experiment and and find what fits you. Because that that really is by far the most important determinant of whether you're going to succeed, whether you truly believe in what you're doing, and whether you are willing to put the time and effort to study it once you found that that method. Yeah, excellent, uh, Ajay. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really enjoyed this, and I think it it kind of confirmed a lot of the things I was thinking. You know. Uh, to myself. And uh, I, I think you shared a lot of important key principles. So thanks again for your time. Um, I, I thank everybody who to stick around to the end. I found it valuable. So thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel uh, for more great interviews like this one. 
Um, Ajay, is there anywhere uh, you would you would point people to if they want to learn more about your system or or you know get in touch with you as well? Yeah, I uh, first I would like to say thank you for this this uh, interview. I really enjoyed it. This is only the second video I did. I was telling you earlier the first one I did with Ali. I was mm -hmm. as a board and I was nervous. And uh, so, you know, hopefully the second time to charm this came up, came off a little bit more, more relaxed, but, you know, I can talk stock for hours. I, I really love it. And, you know, I used to be on, on Twitter very often. I hardly log on now, but people can go and, and see what I've posted in the past to get ideas of what I look at. And otherwise they can find my email address on our, on our website, single a capital, um, and they can email me with questions they have, but I, I really enjoyed this. And uh, most importantly, I hope people find, you know, that there, there is light at the end of the tunnel. As long as you're willing to put work in and find a process that works for you, this, this is, there's no better way to earn a living in my view. I really enjoyed it. So I hope, I hope that others can, can follow along on the same journey. Yeah, for sure. And I'll, I'll drop those links down below in the description so you can find those there. And yeah, we've just had a little bit of extended bear market. So hopefully we, we get some nice uptrends uh, now. Uh, so um, yeah, once again, Jay, thank you so much for your time and uh, to everybody watching, hope you enjoyed and we'll see you guys in future videos. Take care. Thank you very much. Take care, Richard.